I think it's helpful for you first to see the Tetra slab running so you know where you'll be eventually, okay? So I'm gonna do that first and then we're gonna talk about more of the, the details. Um, so when you have the whole thing done and you run the main method of the Tetris viewer class, um, it looks like this. Um, this is the graphical user interface for the Tetris lab. Most of this you don't have to create. Um, yes, you're gonna do some of the graphical user interface because I guess I should take a step back and explain what the purpose of this lab is. Um, this lab is, I think, perfect for this point in the school year. Um, you may find it surprising that we only have one more unit left, okay? Um, in which we're gonna study recursion and some sorting and searching algorithms, some of which you already know. Um, so we've almost covered everything in the course already. Um, and so this lab is designed for you to demonstrate that you can do pretty much everything we've studied in the course. Um, so parts of this lab focus on algorithms, uh, which is the area we probably need the most practice. Um, and I have some pretty challenging algorithms in this lab. Um, I think harder than anything you would see on an AP exam. Um, but, you know, practice things that are harder. And then when we get to the test, it will seem easy. Um, also in this lab will be um, a, you demonstrating that you still remember how to work with arrays and you still remember how to work with array lists. Um, that's a big part of the course. Um, you will be demonstrating that your understanding of inheritance, um, and there's some, some object-oriented design aspects to this lab as well, um, and your understanding of interfaces. Um, so we've been doing the, you know, we did button viewer together, you did triangle GUI on your own. Um, you'll be doing some of the buttons and, and pop-up menus and things like that in this panel right here. Um, so you will be doing some interfaces um, and you will be writing some listeners um, and stuff like that as well. So this lab basically covers it all, which is great. Um, this is the longest lab we do. It's the most challenging lab we do, um, but we're ready for it now, right? We've, we've almost done the whole course in terms of, of content. Um, so we can put something like this together. A lot of this is already written for you so that you can really focus your efforts on each of those areas I just outlined. Um, the easy stuff like writing accessor methods, I just gave that code to you. I don't want you wasting your time writing accessor methods. I want you focused on demonstrating your understanding of the more challenging things. All right, so when, we, when you're all done, it's gonna look like this and you're gonna hit start. And if you haven't seen Tetris before, the way it works is there's different pieces and you can move them around um, and orient them how you want them. Um, and, uh, there's different shapes, like we've got squares here and stuff. There's some way to drop them. I forget what key that is. I should probably know that, but I don't, um, I don't know what key it is. Spacebar maybe? Nope. Oh, there it is. N, I guess. Anyway, um, what makes this, so you can play Tetris and playing Tetris is fun, but what makes this cool is that you can click this button here that says enable brain. And your code, um, well, the algorithm is, the AI algorithm is written for you, but there's an extension for you to write a better one. Um, but it figures out where should the piece go? How should I rotate it? Where should I place it in the most optimal way? Um, and it does an okay job and, and you can certainly make it better and we can speed this thing up because um, it's pretty fast at figuring out where stuff goes. Boy, it really wants one. There you go. Um, this doesn't look great. Oh, lucky, lucky. Oh my gosh. Anyway, we can go really fast and eventually we're going to lose. Um, and there's lots of cool extensions that we'll worry about later. We're not going to get into that right now. All of this of drawing other pieces and stuff and the highlighting the completed rows, that's all done for you. You don't have to worry about that. Um, you have to focus on how do we model a piece? What is the algorithms for rotation? How do all these buttons work? How do we hook up the brains? Um, stuff like that. But this is what it looks like when it's when it's done. Um, here's our lab document. Um, so this this is long. There's a lot of stuff in here. Um, we're not going to go through the whole thing today. I just want to introduce the first two milestones, and that's plenty for now. 
um, and give you some highlights. And I want to focus primarily the first two milestones deal just with one class, the peace class. So the first class you're going to be focused on is implementing the peace class and the peace class models a piece in the game of Tetris. And in the game of Tetris, there are seven different, seven different types of pieces and they have names, the T, the square, the stick, or the long skinny one, the L or periscope, the dog. Um, these are isomers of each other, right? They're like reflected across this line. Um, so these are the seven pieces, okay? The piece class is how we model um, each of these pieces. One challenge with the code we're writing here is that it needs to be relatively fast because when we turn on the brain and it's trying to figure out all the possibilities of how, what are all the ways I can rotate this piece and where are all the places I can put it and which of them would be the best, it has to go through all of those options as the piece is falling. Um, and if it's too slow, it won't come up with a solution before the piece hits the bottom, um, which means our, our brain isn't going to be so smart. Um, so we need to be efficient about this. So as a result, in the piece class, we pre-calculate a bunch of stuff so that we can make these decisions faster. Okay? And that's what you're going to be focused on for the first two milestones. Um, in addition to having these seven pieces, pieces can be rotated. And when we press the key to rotate a piece, it rotates 90 degrees counterclockwise. So the L here goes from here to here to here to here. Um, if we rotate it again, we go back to the beginning. So for some pieces, it takes four rotations to get back to where we are. One, two, three, back to four. For other pieces, it might just take two rotations to get back to where we are, like the stick here and the dog. Um, other pieces, just one rotation gets us back to where we are. The square is a square is a square. It doesn't matter how you rotate it. Um, so rotating is going to be a big part of it. So in order to get the performance we need, the piece class has several instance variables, which you are going to pre-calculate in the constructor for the piece class. Um, so I want to go through what those are, because this is what we're going to focus on in the beginning to explain how we model a piece. Fundamentally, a piece is completely described by its body. And the body is an array of points that describes each pixel that makes up the piece. Okay. Each piece, think of each piece as having its own little coordinate system where the bottom left corner of the bounding box is zero, zero. So this pixel here is zero, zero. So this square piece is made up of zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. Those are the four points that make up the square piece. There may not actually be a pixel and therefore a point in the body at zero, zero, right? So for this dog here, this is the point zero, zero because this is the bounding box of the piece. So there is no point at zero, zero, but there is a point at zero, one and zero, two and one, zero and one, one. Those are the four pieces that make up the dog. So part of what you're going to write in the constructor, um, or part of what you're given in the constructor is an array of these points, which you're going to copy over into the body. Technically, all we need for a piece are what points make up the piece, okay? But for performance reasons, we want to pre-calculate a bunch of other stuff so that we can very quickly assess how where the piece should, should go when we turn on the brain, okay? So what are these other things we care about? Um, we care about the width and the height of the piece. Where, I thought I mentioned that somewhere. Oh, I guess I just mentioned height and width here. So the height and the width of the piece. The width of the piece is the number of pixels that make up its width, okay? It's not the greatest index, it's the number of pixels. This piece has a width of two and a height of three. This piece has a width of one and a height of four, okay? This piece has a width of three and a height of two in this orientation, right? That changes when we rotate it, right? This piece here has a height of two and a width of three, uh, which is different than when it's in this orientation, okay? 
So you'll calculate the height and width of the piece as well. Um, one really important and the most complicated thing we calculate is called the skirt of the piece. The skirt of the piece conceptually is like the bot for each X value. It's like the, the lowest Y value, right? And the reason why we care what the skirt is, is it determines how this piece can sit on top of other pieces. So we pre-calculate this so we can very quickly evaluate where could this go? Where could this rest um, in terms of sitting on the pieces that are already played? Um, so here's what the skirt is. The skirt is an array of ints where the index corresponds to an X value. So the value at index zero corresponds to when X equals zero for the piece, it corresponds to this column. And the value at index one corresponds to when X equals one, which is this column. And what the value is, is the lowest Y value for the corresponding X value. So this piece right here, the lowest y value when x is zero is one, right? Because there is no pixel at, at zero, zero. And the lowest y value when x is one is zero. So the square root of this piece is one, zero. That defines that. Some other examples, because this can be tricky. The skirt of this piece would be one, one, zero. The skirt of this piece would be zero, two. The skirt of, uh, what's another interesting one? Well, this isn't necessarily interesting. The skirt of this piece is zero, 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 right? That's how it fits. The hardest algorithm you're gonna write for milestone one is coming up with the skirt for a given piece. Okay. And we'll look at more details of that in a moment. Milestone two focuses on rotations. Meaning, if a piece starts like this, how do you rotate it to make a new piece that looks like this? And given the body here, what does this body look like? All right. And I have some tips for you on that. I'll show you in the code in a moment. Um, but that's the hardest algorithm that we've got in the first part of this lab, um, is that rotation part. Um, and that's why I recommend doing it on paper for homework. Um, so that you have a sense of the algorithm in advance of trying to write the code. Um, so I encourage you to write it out right here. Here's an important tip. The lower left corner of the bounding box is always zero, zero. So when you rotate this piece, this is zero, zero. And when it, the new piece that rotated is this piece, this point here is zero, zero. This point here is zero, zero. This point here is zero, zero. So when you rotate it, you got to make sure you're honoring where zero, zero is in terms of the origin. Okay. All right. So I've divided this up into multiple milestones. What we found in the past when we did this lab is that students really struggled with the algorithms in milestone one and two, like really, really struggled. Um, and so what Mr. Callahan and I realized was needed is you need a little bit of help for these first couple milestones. So what makes this unique for a summative lab is the first two milestones you're gonna do with your pair programming partner, okay? Because having a second brain to help you work through this is really helpful. So we're gonna actually do pair programming for milestone one and two. And then beyond that, you'll do the rest of the summative lab independently, okay? So that's a big change. Usually we don't work on summative labs together. Um, but I've made it clear what parts are, are pair programming. So for milestone one, um, you're going to implement just the constructor for the piece class. And I'm going to show you that code in a moment. For every milestone, I have a way you can test it and get immediate feedback that it works as expected. So after you implement the constructor, you can run the main method of the JPS test class, which is already written for you. And if it looks like this picture exactly, like the highlighted yellows and all the widths and the heights and all the pieces, then you know you did it right. And you can move on to milestone two. And if it doesn't look like this picture exactly, don't move on to milestone two. Go back and, 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 and fix it. Um, ask for help as needed. Milestone two focuses on implementing the two string method and that really tricky piece row method where you're gonna work it out on paper first. 
after you do that, you can run the test again and you can make sure all the rotations look right. And if it looks just like this, you're ready to move on to milestone three, um, which is all on your own, okay? We're not gonna worry about anything beyond the piece class today in terms of an introduction, because I don't want this to be too overwhelming. Of course, if you're curious, you can read through the rest of this lab, um, but we're just gonna focus on the piece class. So let's look at some of the code here in the piece class. I really wanted you to put your efforts at like the most challenging parts of this lab. So a lot of the code is already written for you because I know that you know how to write like an accessor method. Um, I know you know how to define instance variables. So I'm not gonna have you do that. I'm gonna have you do the challenging stuff. So in the piece class here, I've already defined all the instance variables you need, okay? Um, I've already defined the header for the constructor. Where you need to add code, it will always say to do, okay? So I have several to do's here for you to work your way through. And I also try to warn you against common pitfalls that students tend to run into. So the first task here, the first to do says copy the points array, which is the parameter, um, and copy each point element in the array. And you're gonna be copying that into this array body. And here are like the pitfalls. If you say this dot body equals points, that simply copies the reference to the array. It does not create a new array of point objects. That will not work. If you say this dot body sub i equals point sub i, that copies the reference stored in the points array into the element in the body array. It does not create a new point object. That will not work, okay? So I'm trying to caution you against like the most common pitfalls here. Um, you'll figure out the width, you'll figure out the height, those algorithms you've done before. Um, you'll figure out the skirt, which is the hardest part of the constructor. Um, so I gave you some pseudocode here, if you need a little help. Um, little pseudocode for how to figure out the skirt. <coughs> all right. When you finish all this, then you would go back to the BlueJ project window, You'd right click on JP's test, you'd run the main method, and you would look for it to look just like this one. And if it did, you'd move on. So most of the rest of this code is already written for you. These are the accessors. You don't have to write those. You don't have to change any of that. Um, I wrote the equals method because it's a little bit beyond the scope of this course. You'll have to write the two string method. You've done that before. That's not too bad. Um, and you'll have to write the piece row method, which is the algorithm to do on paper. So some of the loop stuff I've set up for you so that you can focus really, again, I'm just trying to like have you focus on specific things. So I want you to focus on the algorithm, not writing for loops. Um, so I've broken this into steps. Um, this is not the only way to rotate a piece. This is the way that historically students have said makes the most sense to them. Um, so I broke it down into those three steps that most students say, hey, this makes the most sense. It's all about geometry. It's all about reflections and translations. Um, so you gotta apply some of that, that mathematical experience um, into the algorithm and into the code. And once you have this done, um, you'll still need to read the other code so you know which variables you need to use. Once you have these three steps done, you can go back to the BlueJ project window, you can run JP's test again, and you can verify it looks like this one. Okay? And you'll be off and, off and running. And then you're done with the piece class and you're done with the pair programming, pair programming part. Um, yeah, so this is designed um, so that you get lots of checks along the way. So you know you're on the right track, you know you're on pace, you know that the stuff works. Because if the piece class isn't done correctly, the rest of the lab is just gonna like fall apart. It's the, it's the fundamental class for the rest of this lab. So in a moment, if you haven't already, you're gonna actually accept a new GitHub Classroom assignment um, because I wanted a whole new project for this because there's a lot of code involved. So I have a link here to the Tetris GitHub assignment. So you'll, you'll accept that. 
and then you can check it out in BlueJ just like you would at the start of a new unit. One thing I recommend doing um, when you load it up in BlueJ, press Control J on Windows or Command J on the Mac and generate the documentation um, because it's helpful to be able to browse the Java docs for all these different classes. Um, so I recommend you do that. Um, and then for pair programming stuff, so we're gonna have about 20 some minutes. So we'll probably do, so decide who's gonna be driver, who's gonna be navigator. We'll swap in like 10 minutes so everybody gets a little chance. Um, really important at the end of today and the end of every day that you're doing pair programming, make sure your pair programming partner has the code as well, right? So commit and push to GitHub and email them, message them, whatever you want to do to make sure they have the code as well. 